Thanksgiving this week. I am going to get lots of exercise in before Thursday, in Jesus' name. Hey, uh, if you have your Bibles, whether digital or print, join me in Acts 18. We're going to start at the end of Acts 18, read a few verses, jump into Acts 19. We've been walking through the book of Acts all together and learning uh, what does it look like to be a radiant people and a radiant church and how do we live in that way, learning from the first century uh, believers and how they live the radiant life. And uh, recently we've been kind of journeying with the Apostle Paul as he's been taking these missionary journeys. And we're going to look at a part of his third missionary journey today. And uh, it kind of goes all through these regions in Asia and um, Greece and all these places. In fact, you can look on the screen and see kind of a map of where his journey went. He started in Antioch, as he often did, traveled all the way around, and over the years would eventually find himself in Jerusalem. Now, quick spoiler alert if you haven't finished reading the book of Acts yet. In Jerusalem, he would eventually be arrested From there, being arrested, he would be taken to put on trial in Rome, where he would spend the rest of his days imprisoned and writing letters and um, doing all sorts of things. And so we are nearing the end of this story and the end of the book. And uh, next week, I'm going to do a bit of a recap, looking back over what are some of the key principles to a radiant church. Uh, You're not going to want to miss it. We also have water baptism and child dedication next week. Sunday. So um, if you haven't signed up for either of those, highly recommend you get that done today. Um, And so we're going to recap that. So all all I'm saying is, uh, if you haven't finished the book of Acts, go finish the book of Acts this week and next week, and kind of finish out the story of what this early church looked like. But we're going to look at Acts 18, starting in verse 24, and see kind of the end of a journey and then the beginning of this third journey, and look specifically at at a stop that Paul has in the city of Ephesus. Everybody say Ephesus. Very good. Acts 18, starting verse 24. This is what it says. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker, who knew the scriptures well, had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. He had been taught the way of the Lord, And he taught others about Jesus with enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. I love that. What we have learned of Jesus, we ought to be teaching to others about what we do know. You don't have to know everything about Jesus to tell someone what you do know about Jesus. And that's what he was doing. He was doing it enthusiastically and doing it well with accuracy. However... He only knew about John's baptism. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God more accurately. In other words, there was some truth that he had, and it was true and solid, but he was missing some components, specifically the baptism of Jesus receiving the Holy Spirit in his life. And they explained to him more accurately the gospel and the truth of Jesus. Let's get down to the beginning of chapter 19. So while Apollos was now in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he had found several believers. Who did he find? Several believers. Open book test. You, I believe in you. What did he find? Who did he find in Ephesus? Several believers. Very good. Very good. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Well, then what baptism did you receive? He asked. They replied, well, the baptism of John. Silly rabbit. Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. 
there were about 12 men in all. Then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way meaning the way of Jesus. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for, set for the next two years so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. God gave Paul the power to perform some unusual miracles. When the handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched Paul's skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases, and evil spirits were expelled. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantations, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches, come out! Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the spirit replied back to them, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? Actually, I don't know that's what it sounded like, but it seemed like a highly theatrical moment for us. The man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. Y'all, I'm not making this up. You should read the Bible. There's some wild things in Scripture. The story, this is like the most, oh yeah, by the way, the story of what just happened spread quickly all through Ephesus. You think? A solemn fear descended on the city. And the name of the Lord was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. And a number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at the public bonfire. The value of these books was several million dollars. So the message about the Lord spread wildly and had a powerful effect. Friends, when God starts to get a hold of your life, your previous life is worth nothing compared to knowing Christ. Doesn't matter how much money you've put into the things that you do, the businesses, the lifestyle, the things. If it gets in the way of Jesus, Jesus says, am I worth it? to which we respond with holy fear and reverence, worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. What a wild story. What a wild adventure. What some astonishing things that kind of mess along with us. Today, I want to do my best to help us understand some very, very important truths about Scripture and about the work of salvation in our lives I'm going to do it and nuance some things for those of us who have been in church and in the way of Jesus and even in Pentecostal tradition or non-Pentecostal traditions, wherever kind of side of that uh, line of thinking you've come. I'm going to create some nuance for us to think uh, perhaps a little more accurately or as I would describe it more accurately. But if this is kind of a new subject matter for you and a new topic for you, I don't want you to get lost in the nuance. I want you to hold on to some truths as we do it. And here's the first truth I need everyone to see and understand. And that is this, that the radiant church receives and responds to the work of the Holy Spirit. If I could say it another way, in a repeating way, so that you can understand what I'm trying to say, it would be this. You will not become radiant until you receive the Holy Spirit in your life. It won't happen. Because his very presence is what creates the radiance of God in your life. His very activity in you, among you, surrendered to him, is what brings about the character of God growing in you. Without the work of the Spirit in your life, um, you are missing part of the testimony, as we talked about in communion, 
that verifies who the Son of God is to you in your life. Why didn't Apollos, why didn't these men and those believers in Ephesus, why didn't they receive the Holy Spirit when they believed? Why, why was it they understood like repentance is an important thing, the, the baptism of John is necessary? Why? why? There, there are some um, theologians, some scholars, even some commentaries that would uh, say that, well, Apollos and those believers in Ephesus, they weren't really believers. They, they, they were God adjacent. They, they didn't really experience salvation. And I, I tend to have a, a, a slight disagreement in that way. Uh, there is nothing in the text that says they weren't believers. In fact, the text says otherwise. They absolutely believed in Jesus. Now, is this a belief in Jesus like the demons have a belief in Jesus, where they accurately know that he's the son of God, that they accurately know some things, they, they have some intellectual agreement and assent to some things, but they've never really given their allegiance to the Lord that, that allows the saving work of Jesus to occur? Well, I think that that's a possibility, but it doesn't seem to be the case, definitely not for Apollos. Apollos knew the Lord, knew the scriptures about God, was preaching and declaring and helping others discover Jesus with boldness and great accuracy. In other words, it was an effective work that was happening. Now, I want to be very clear. What we read in this text where they're saying, well, you only got the baptism of John. You need the baptism of Jesus. This is not a dismissal for, or, for the importance of water baptism. It's not that at all, actually. In fact, when Jesus said to go make disciples, he said to go and make disciples and baptize them, not just for the repentance of their sins, as John proclaimed. Jesus said to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. That there were some important components to this baptism. It was not a dismissal of the sacrament of water baptism as an embodied illustration of the cleansing work of Jesus becoming united with him. No, we believe water baptism is a cleansing work and it is a statement that unites us with Christ. It is something beautiful and wonderful. In fact, water baptism throughout church history has always been a key sacrament for the church. Two major sacraments that the people of God have always held on to as important to use, practice, and repeat. Water baptism and Holy Communion. These are two sacraments that from the very beginning of the church have always been maintained in this space and in the place of the people of God. So much so, water baptism as an important sacrament. It was if you were willing to publicly renounce your other allegiances and publicly pronounce your allegiance to Jesus and the creedal beliefs and the doctrines of the, the triune God in whom we serve, then you were then accepted into the local congregation. In other words, uh, for much of the early history of the church, uh, they did a bit of vetting to make sure you weren't some charlatan that what you believed in your allegiance to Jesus was genuine and true. And, and, and they would wait because the church took such good care of each other financially. They weren't letting just anyone in because they needed some financial handouts. They wanted to make sure you're really among us. In other words, they really took to, to heart the meaning that Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. That you're going to know that you're my disciples by how you love one another. And that's not a statement of loving the world, loving the lost, or evangelism. That was a statement about caring for those in the family of God. And they practiced it well. And so water baptism was such an important part of what they were doing. So, so as we read this and we see these stories, this isn't a throwaway for water baptism. I would, I would simply say, While many of my Pentecostal friends would say that it is exclusively a second work of grace receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, a second work of Pentecost, if you will, apart from salvation, I, I would differ a little bit from them in this, that it doesn't actually have to be. It doesn't have to be. The work of the Holy Spirit can begin in someone's life the moment they repent. The moment they respond with allegiance to Jesus and the waters of baptism in their life, 
and in asking to receive the Holy Spirit. It doesn't have to be a progressive with space and time. It can. In this case, it was. In fact, up until the late 1200s, water baptism was integrated in with them receiving the Holy Spirit. They would, they would do these water baptisms and candidates for baptism would, would spend about a year in uh, understanding the doctrine and, and make sure that they believed the things. And then after about a year or so, they would be a candidate for baptism where they would publicly announce their creed and their beliefs and who Jesus is, who the Father is, who the Spirit is, that who, what the church is, and then the coming nature of Christ, this fourfold kind of creedal statement that they would make. And they would go into the waters where they'd be cleansed and, and leave behind a life of sin and get delivered and they'd come up out of the waters and then the bishops would be there with oil and anoint them with oil and pray that they would receive. They would confer the Holy Spirit on them until the late 1200s because in the 1200s the church had grown and there were so many churches and so much happening that that the bishops couldn't get there anymore so they kept baptizing people but they, they would always delay and so they would create this moment of what was called confirmation in the early church where the then then they would come back and confer the Holy Spirit on somebody who's lived a life a little bit longer and And over time, it just got separated from that moment. Remember, Jesus said to baptize in the name of the Father and baptize in the name of the Son and baptize in the name of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I would would suggest that our understanding of the infilling of the Holy Spirit isn't meant to necessarily be separate, but rather we need a more robust understanding of what we would call salvation. That, That we need a little bit more robust understanding about what it means to give our lives and see the work of Jesus in us. I, I think that it is important for us to know that, that, that the Holy Spirit, that what it looks like is it's an act of repentance, it's a response of our allegiance, and it's receiving the Holy Spirit. That is how the work of God unfolds in all of our lives. I, I think it's less about these passages For those of you like me growing up in charismatic Pentecostal environments, I think these passages are less about establishing a way in which it always occurs and more about the importance of seeing that it always occurs. In other words, um, as you read through the book of Acts, hopefully you've picked up on this, that they didn't really go around saying, hey, 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 have you been saved yet? Like that wasn't their language. They didn't go around and say, hey, have you been water baptized yet? Have you joined a church yet? They were consistently going around and saying, hey, um, have you received the Holy Spirit yet? Have you invited the Spirit's work into your life that saves you, redeems you, makes you whole and holy? Have have you experienced this three-part witness of the work of God in your life? Is your life bearing witness to these things, to the work of God that has happened in you? And this is what was happening with Paul when he came to the church in Ephesus. He showed up and found people who believed in God, loved God, wanted to serve God, honor God, recognized that they were sinful people that had repented of their sins and been in the waters of of baptism, trying to repent and cleanse themselves of some things, but, but they had not yet received the power of the Spirit in their life because their life was not seeing the transformation transformation of God yet there were some things that were still there was there was an element to the witness that needed to occur there was a work of God that needed to happen in their life and so uh, friends I'm not here to try to parse out when and if and how and why I'm just here to tell you you cannot live the radiant life apart from receiving the person of the spirit in your life and that's the priority for the early church and it has to be a priority For us, I want to give us a couple thoughts today as we keep walking through what does this look like, what does this mean, how does it impact our lives. And like the church in Ephesus, I want you to see, number one, that the Holy Spirit is conferred to us. They laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. There was an intentional impartation, if you will, of receiving the Holy Spirit. There's, this is why when we pray for people, often we will lay a hand on them. When we do baby dedications next Sunday, 
As a family, we're going to gather around those who are dedicating their children and their families to the Lord, asking for the Holy Spirit to be a part of their life. We're going to lay hands on them and pray that God would seal them with his spirit, keep them protected, and that the presence of God would be in their lives, in their homes, leading their children. When, when people come up out of the water of baptism next Sunday, they exit down the stairs, our, we're going to have people there to pray and lay hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit. Why? Water baptism is an act of public repentance and cleansing. Repentance cleanses us. Receiving the Holy Spirit fills us back up. There are things in your life before you gave your allegiance to Jesus that you need to empty out of your life. There's evil that has been growing, sin that has been abiding. The presence of the enemy and his work has been in our lives and in our hearts, and it must be expelled from us we have to be cleansed from it washed of it emptied out so that we can be filled with the holy spirit we already read in acts chapter 8 and we saw that it's possible for somebody to intellectually accept jesus as messiah to walk through the ceremony of water baptism but still not be filled and restored by the holy spirit it's not that it has to happen later. It can happen later. In other words, if you've repented and you know you've been water baptized, but nobody's ever prayed and conferred the Holy Spirit on you, that can happen. That's what happened in Ephesus. That's what happened to Apollos. It can happen to any of us. And we can all be recipients of that at any moment in time. And Jesus said, if you ask, then you receive. But, but it also doesn't mean that it has to be at a later time. Because when Jesus came up out of the waters of baptism, what happened? The Holy Spirit was conferred and came down and settled on him too. It's, it can happen. It's not such a big deal when it happens. It's important that it happens. I think one of the greatest understandings of the saving work of God in our lives is seen in the picture of the children of Israel during the exodus out of Egypt. The, the word salvation means to rescue and make whole. To rescue and now make whole. To rescue from sin and death and the work of the enemy in our lives, the evil that arises and abides in us, to rescue us from evil and to make us whole by the presence of Jesus. This is what happened. The picture of what happened in Egypt through the exodus to the promised land is the visible picture that the Bible wants to give us of what the saving work of God looks like in all of our lives. In other words, it took a moment for God and his power to get them out of Egypt, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of them and into the promised land. There is a work of renewing and wholeness that occurs in our life that only occurs because the Spirit is with us. I think that's the best picture to understand those things. Because, in fact, when Peter writes about the importance of salvation, and I think it's First Peter, maybe Second Peter, it's one of the Peters, he's writing a letter and he's reminding them, hey, remember, you were saved through the water. What he's really saying is you were delivered the evil of Egypt was coming hard and fast after you, but I buried them in the water. In water baptism, you know what we're doing? It, for the early church and for much of history, it was, don't get tripped out by this word, um, it was a deliverance of sorts. This is the word I don't want you to get tripped out on. It was an exorcism of sorts. Of recognizing I have lived my life away from God and I need to repent. I've given my heart to idols and worship. And the people in Ephesus, if you keep reading in chapter 19, you will see they gave themselves to idolatry and worship of other things prior that, that took a prominence of God instead of God himself. And there were some things that had to be like let go of. There were some sorcery, some incantations, some, some deep evil that was rooted in their lives that had to get out. And it was in the waters that they buried. They were cleansed. They were filled. And so when we come up out of the water, we come up new in Christ, but there's something that has to be filled in us, and it's the Holy Spirit. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 12. When an evil spirit leaves a person, Jesus says, 
it goes into the desert, seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home empty, swept, and everything clean and put in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. So that person is worse off than they were before. This will be the experience, he says, of this evil generation. What, what, what the? Hold on. Here, here's what Jesus is hinting at. That for, for many of us, we go through the waters, we make repentance. We get to the waters and we get cleansed and filled and we get united with Christ. Okay, I'm in Christ, I'm, I'm him. But we've never asked for the Holy Spirit to be filling us and we never fill up with the Spirit. Our house is still empty. And the enemy comes back twice as strong after a period of time. I, I've been in pastoral ministry for uh, 20 years now. And I've been following Jesus and serving the church long before that. There is something that happens over time after someone gets through the waters of baptism. I see it play out again and again in so many people's lives. It takes so much faith and so much courage to like finally get to the moment of publicly identifying yourself with Christ, to publicly going forth and saying, I was a sinner and I need a savior. I'm repenting and I'm asking Jesus to do a work in me and I want to enter the waters of baptism. And we get nervous about being in front of people and wed and all the things. And people, I've talked to people and they're like, I don't really want to do that publicly because people will think that I'm a sinner. That's the point. We're acknowledging what's up. I'm a mess. <laughs> like, that's, that's the thing. And we, it takes so much courage and so much faith, and we learn and we understand what it means, and we, we don't want to take it lightly. And I love people who take that approach slow, and, and we take our time, and we really want to make sure we're making a commitment to follow Jesus. And I think that's really the, the best way to do it. It's not the only way. It, God works in other ways, but, but there's something important about that way. And, and you get into the waters, and you come up out of the waters, and, and then you go through, and you've got the picture, and you've got the towel, and you've got the stuff, and it feels great and wonderful uh, until a couple months later, and it's like all hell is coming for you and habits and cravings and things are creeping back in and you feel like you get trapped again listen what jesus doesn't say is that when the devil comes back twice as strong coming for you again that you're helpless he doesn't say you're a lost cause and you can't find redemption and forgiveness and renewal again he's just illustrating that when we walk through the moment of repentance and the waters that cleanse us as we uh, announce our allegiance to Jesus in a response to him in that way, we need to receive the Holy Spirit so we're filled up. Because when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, nothing else can get into the space. We need the Holy Spirit conferred on us. Here's, Here's the second thing we see from the church in Ephesus I want us to understand is that the Holy Spirit is confirmed in us and among us. There are confirming evidences of the work of the Spirit in your life. Now, some of you, like me, you grew up in a more Pentecostal tradition, and you may have heard that the only evidence of a person's life filled with the Holy Spirit is that they speak in tongues. I think it's an evidence. It's a benefit. It's a element of the gift of the Spirit in our lives, but it is not the only evidence to the work of the Spirit in our lives. But it is something that was seen and demonstrated in the lives of these apostles and these disciples. They began to speak in tongues. There are three things that I think uh, help us see and know that the work of the Spirit is happening in our lives. Are you ready? Three things. Fruit, gifts, and a growing consecration. These are the three things that Scripture shows us and helps us see and understand that the work of the Spirit has happened in us, and it's being confirmed in us and among us and around us. How do I know the Holy Spirit's in my life? How do I know that it's there? It's, it's these things. It's the fruit, it's the gifts, and it's a growing consecration. Recently, 
Last week, I was um, installing a garage door opener in, in my garage. That's right. I used power tools, and I didn't die. Miracles happen. Mainly because Amber was there making sure that I did everything correctly. Let's not tell a lie. But as would be the case and probably assumed to be, I ran into some trouble, and it was not working correctly. And we began to troubleshoot it. And in the troubleshooting process, there were certain features that needed to begin to work to indicate that it was being installed properly. It was the features of the garage door opener that led me to know the evidence of this garage door is operating properly. The same is true with the person of the Holy Spirit in your life. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? When somebody pray and invite the Holy Spirit to fill your life, how how do I know? Well, first, the fruit, Galatians 5. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. Are you growing in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness? I don't care if you can speak in tongues, pray for people, and they get healed, have prophetic words, but if you're a mean old, letters S, O, and another one, (laughs) the work of the Spirit is being limited in your life. I don't care if you hoop, shout, holler, and feel the Holy Spirit bumps every time you're in worship. Are you gentle or a jerk? It matters. Thought I'd see a few more amens, but everybody's saying, oh my, I get it. (laughs) Right? Like, there's a fruit in our, are you loving at all? It's the work of the... You can't display these attributes on, it's a work of the Spirit in your life. Pro- producing that, that fruit. It's not just the, the fruit of the Spirit, but there are gifts of the Spirit that come along with the Holy Spirit in our lives. Primarily, not primarily, primarily 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 tell us about these gifts. There's nine of them. One of them is a prayer language called tongues. It's part of it. It's one of the benefits to the package. It's like uh, when you buy a new car, and it has all of these high features. You might not know all the features that your car has. It doesn't mean that the features aren't there. You have yet to learn how to use them. Buy a new phone. Your phone has all sorts of capabilities. Some of us are like, I don't know, I just want to call and hang up a call accurately and not pocket dial somebody while I'm sitting down to go to the bathroom. That's all I want to be able to do, oh Lord. Right? But your phone can do so much, but you may not know all of the features that are in that. The Holy Spirit, when he fills our lives, comes and he produces fruit, but he also comes with gifts. 1 Corinthians 14. And one of the gifts is a prayer language. 1 Corinthians 14. Let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire the special abilities the Holy Spirit gives. Full stop. You and I should be desiring these special abilities of the Spirit. Not afraid of them, not rejecting them, not avoiding them, desiring them. Full stop. Especially the ability to prophesy. For you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking to God since people won't be able to understand you. True story. You will be speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them, 
A person who speaks in tongue is strengthened personally, but the one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. I wish you could all speak in tongues. Pause. He's talking about in the context of a full church service. I wish you all could prophesy. I wish you would all get up and speak in tongues. I wish you would all see all of the gifts all of the time at all times, but there needs to be some daggum order in your church. You're a little chaotic and confusing to a lot of people. So have some order, have a plan, put it together, and let the Holy Spirit do his work. That's the entirety of what he's trying to say in all of 1 Corinthians 14. But he does say, I I wish you could all speak in tongues, and even more that you would all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets so that you will know what the whole church is saying and that you will all be strengthened. In other words, I want you all to speak in tongues. You all can speak in tongues. It's good for you to speak in tongues. He would go on to say, I pray more in tongues than all of you, but you all ought to do it too. And then he's sitting there saying, but it's really good when you're all together for somebody to prophesy in a language you can understand so that everybody can be strengthened. But when you pray in tongues, you are talking to God. And sometimes we don't know what to pray when we're talking to God. But when we pray in the Spirit, we're praying the mysteries and the perfect will of God all at the same time. In fact, when you pray in the Spirit, when you pray in tongues, when you use the gift of the Spirit, of the prayer language, you're actually, according to Paul, strengthening your own faith. Ever been in a place where you wanted to do the will of God, but you didn't feel like you had the strength to do the will of God? I have. You ever find yourself giving into temptation and a habit and a mindset that you couldn't break free from? You need to pray in tongues. Because when you pray in the tongues, when you pray in the Spirit, you strengthen and edify your faith to do the will of God, to live out a godly life. And it's mysteries. You're not going to understand it. So when you're praying in tongues, you're praying to God and keep praying to God. If you're leading people, you don't need to pray in tongues because they're not going to understand what you're saying. So instead, pray in a language they understand. This is what Paul is saying. He's not canceling out the benefit of praying in tongues by saying, I wish you all would prophesy so you all would understand. It would be like me saying, man, I wish you all could come to my house and eat dinner and taste my wife's amazing cooking. And y'all could gain the weight instead of me. I wish... But I really, really wish you could taste her new sourdough cinnamon rolls because, my Lord, you'll slap somebody's mama when you eat one like they are. My talking about how good her cinnamon rolls are doesn't negate the need or value or desire for you to taste all of her cooking. It's just emphasizing one part that right now, oh, man, it's so good. Paul is saying, I I want you to pray in tongues because your faith needs it. Your strength needs it. You you feel weak at times and you need to feel stronger. And when you pray in the spirit, you build up your own faith to walk with God, to follow God, to live for God, to, to overcome the things that have easily held you back in. I remember when I was a kid and I was so afraid at night, laying in bed, and my dad and my mom would come and say, just pray in the spirit until you fall asleep because you can't walk in the spirit and in the spirit of fear at the same time. When I'm feeling anxious, worried, and I don't know what to do, and anxiety is creeping in, you know what I do? I pray in the spirit. You want to know one of the ways that I've been able to overcome temptations at different seasons in my life? I've prayed in the spirit. It's, It's like the Swiss army knife of the Christian faith has so many tools and benefits being filled with the Holy Spirit. And you're not going to live the Christian life. You're not going to experience the full wholeness of God now and an ongoing way, that eternal relationship with God that we read about in 1 John with only two of the three witnesses in your life. You need all three. And so like Apollo, so many of you know the way of Jesus. You follow the way of Jesus. You can theologically and doctrinally bring about the truths of God's word and bring them and share them with other people. But there are some things missing where you need more explained more accurately to the ways of God. And I'm trying to explain it more accurately to you today. 
Friends, the gifts and the fruit all work in tandem. You, you might sit there and say, well, Pastor, I, I know I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, I, I've even given some words to some people, but I don't have the prayer language uh, part. Maybe that's just not my gift. Maybe that's another one. Well, it's the same Spirit. And I think God wants us to operate, and we can operate in all of the gifts of the Spirit at all times. Let me ask you this question. Which of the fruit is it okay for you to not have? Which of the fruit of the Spirit is it okay for you not to have in your life? Which one doesn't God... God, God only wants to give you the gift of love, but it's not going to be a gentle love. It's going to be a tough love. That's the fruit. No. All the fruit is for all of us. All of the gifts are for all of us. Why, why, don't, why don't I pray in tongues? I, over the last 20 years, if I could just put on my practitioner hat for a minute, because many of you have desired this. You, you, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, and you're asking, man, I, I, just, I would really like to pray in tongues, to have a prayer language. Can, can I just give you a few? Reasons why sometimes I have found that have hindered people from doing it. Number one, it's a mental block. Paul says it's a mystery. And sometimes we can't reconcile the two thoughts. You'll be praying and you'll start to hear these inspired thoughts in your mind of sounds and utterances, symbols and phrases, or, or words and phrases rather. It sounds like baby gibberish to you in your mind when you've heard it and when you've thought it in your mind, you're like, yeah, that can't be true. It's a mental block it's a mystery but we're invited into that mystery if you could explain everything of God and about God you would be God yourself there are some things that are mysterious to us but just because they're mysterious doesn't prevent us from partnering and participating in them second reason I think sometimes we don't pray in the spirit or have that language released where we haven't learned how to turn on that seat warmer in our car yet because we've never asked thus we've never received have you ever asked the Holy Spirit to bring up the gift of praying in the Spirit prayer language ever asked have you ever asked to receive the Holy Spirit at all Jesus was really clear when you ask you'll receive number three I think there's a lack of discipleship or exposure and examples that you've been around in this area. Have you ever even heard anyone pray in tongues? You want to know how uh, my prayer language was released and developed in my life? No lie. I just listened to my dad pray in the Spirit and I mimicked what he said. Let me ask you a question. How do your kids learn to speak English it's called discipleship that's what it's called it's discipleship and often we just haven't been around it heard it somebody demonstrate it for us I've heard some, some pastors um, rebuke this thought say, saying that don't tell people just to mimic what they're hearing that's not the real thing I would humbly suggest they're missing the element of discipleship because everything in the kingdom of God grows through discipleship. And I know so many people, when they get familiar with it, it helps break down the mental block to release what the Spirit does in us regardless. Number four, these last two are a little bit more um, hard-hitting but they're true nonetheless. One of the reasons why people don't pray in tongues and they haven't seen that gift released is because you're too arrogant. You're walking in pride and you're trying to control outcomes. And you've never surrendered and repented of pride, specifically, arrogance, or trying to control something. And you've never surrendered that part of your life to the Lord. Pastor, why would you say that? Because the Holy Spirit is gentle. He operates in the fruit too. 
and he will not override your agency and authority in your life. He, he, he just won't do it. He won't make you do something that your will hasn't surrendered to, which means you will never be in Walmart and the Holy Spirit comes up and just starts moving your tongue and yada, yada, blah, 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 right? Like, it's just not going to happen. Like, and what is happening, right? First yeah. Corinthians 14, later on, it says, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. You can begin to pray in tongues if you want and you can stop praying in tongues if you want. It's your agency. I could, I could right now start praying in tongues and I can right now choose not to pray in tongues because the spirit of the prophet is subject to which means when people do stupid th- I'm sorry that was a little harsh when people do foolish and silly things and they say well the Holy Spirit made me do it nah dog you could have not yelled after people said amen you could have not hooped in- you could have not done some things but you also can lift your hands in worship if you want to Holy Spirit's not going to come down and whoosh, like, oh, Holy Spirit's taking over. Uh, no, because no. self-control is part of his fruit. Gentleness is part of his fruit. And he won't override your agency or your arrogance. And so some of us have theological um, strongholds where we still somewhere inside of us believe that it's wrong and it's not available today and until we repent of that incorrect belief that arrogant belief we'll stay limited from that gift finally here's here's the last one Um, many of us don't pray in the spirit because we've never surrendered our tongue We gossip, we use slander, we curse, speak profane things, use vulgarity, and we've never repented for our tongue. James says, the tongue is like untamable fire. No man can tame the tongue. True story. No man can tame your tongue. That's why you need the Holy Spirit to do it for you. And one of the reasons we don't pray in the Spirit is because we've never surrendered our tongue and repented for what we've used it for. And when we do, the Holy Spirit says, okay, I can, I can fill that mouth now that it's clean. It's a real practical thing, but sometimes that keeps us from seeing that gift operate in our lives. Friends, the Holy Spirit wants to lead us into a robust consecration to God. How do I know the Holy Spirit's filling my life? There's fruit, gifts, and consecration, a growing consecration. What, What did they do in Ephesus? They started repenting, receiving the Spirit, and turning away from their sinful practices. What were some of those sinful practices? Go read Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17, and you'll see those sinful practices. Lustful things, adultery, immorality, lies, slander, jealousy, theft, deception, anger, wrath, grieving the Holy Spirit in the process, it says. And then he gives them a remedy. Instead of putting on those practices, put away those sinful practices. And in verse 20, he says, uh, or starting in verse 15, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity because these days are evil, y'all. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't get drunk with wine because that'll ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. In the Greek, that word be, for, that phrase be filled means be being filled. How many times do you need to fill your car up with gas? Once? And that's all? 
if only you're you have to fill it and refill it and refill it and come on and refill it if we're going to grow in our consecration and holiness before God and the godliness that he's calling us to we need to be filled and refilled with the Holy Spirit on the daily how do I fill myself up he says singing psalms hymns spiritual song among yourselves making music in the Lord to your hearts and giving thanks to God for everything in the Father according to our Lord Jesus Christ in other words use your mouth to fill yourself with the Spirit one of the ways we can use our mouth to build up our faith in the Spirit is praying in the Spirit too it's a gift to help you live the radiant life instead of living radioactive, practicing the sinful ways and instead practicing and participating in the Spirit's ways. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? It matters for your assignment on life. It matters for your assignment on life. To be a mom filled with the Holy Spirit to be a teacher filled with the Holy Spirit, to be a business worker filled with, to be a truck driver filled with the Holy Spirit, to refill propane filled with the Holy Spirit, to be a cook filled with the Holy Spirit, to be a coach filled with the Holy Spirit, to work on a construction site filled with the Holy Spirit, to work cattle filled with the Holy Spirit. It's important for your assignment on life that you become radiant happens through the work of the Spirit. Amen? Can we stand? And each week, we kind of end our time together just asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? Would you do that? Would you just kind of posture yourself in a place to listen for a minute, take a couple deep breaths, and just say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? What is God doing and saying and speaking to you? Maybe it's about actually repenting. You've never repented. Maybe it's about responding with allegiance to Jesus and signing up for water baptism that's happening next Sunday. Maybe it's receiving the Holy Spirit. You've never asked. No one's ever prayed laid hands on you, anointed you with oil. What, what is your next step today? Holy Spirit, we, we want to be more like Jesus. We don't want to live like Apollos, limited in our witness, but we want to allow the full witness of who Jesus is operating in our lives, the blood, the water, and the Spirit. So Lord, would you help us receive your spirit in full measure, in fullness? Lord, would you help us to become more like Jesus? Not to be impressive or earn spiritual credit or, man, none of those things, God helping us to put on Christ more and more and grow in his ways. Lord, for those this week would, that would sit and ask you to fill them with the Holy Spirit, and maybe they would ask even specifically for the gift of praying in tongues, God, would you grant them that? Would you meet them in that moment? And Lord, would they respond in faith and begin to speak out that heavenly language that you give them? We thank you for it. God, we love you. You're so good to us, Jesus. You're so good to us, Jesus. We thank you for it. And we pray it in the name of the Father who loves us, the Son who died for us, and in the name of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, we pray. And all the people of God said, amen. And we've got a team available. They'd love to pray with you. Uh, maybe for this very thing, they'd be happy to do that, I know. Maybe you need to sign up for baptism. You can do that too. 
Some of you are like, man, I'd, I'd really like to learn more about this, or I've got some questions. You can reach out anytime. We're happy to talk. But some of you are ready. Like, you, you really want to receive your prayer language. Can I give you some real practical things today to do? Number one, go find a safe space where, like, you're not distracted and, like, worried about people watching you or anything like that. And turn on some worship music. Maybe go to Spotify and play our worship set from today. And just begin to worship for a little bit, out loud, so you can hear yourself singing. Then ask Jesus to fill you with the Holy Spirit. He's the baptizer. He's the one who does it. It's his baptism. Ask him, Holy Jesus, would you fill me with the Holy Spirit and release or give me the gift to pray in the Spirit. Then begin to praise God in English out loud. Just start praising God with your words. Use your words. And as you do that, you'll begin to hear in your mind utterances, phrases, sounds. It's going to feel and sound a little bit like baby talk. Like it's going to sound just babyish to you. That's okay. It's because it's unfamiliar to you and it's a mystery. And if we're going to enter the kingdom of God anyways, we have to become a little bit more like children to begin with. So just begin in faith to utter aloud those phrases, syllables, and sounds and just keep repeating it and trust that that's the Holy Spirit in you. Well, how do I know it's the Holy Spirit, not the devil? Because the devil has no desire for you to do this whatsoever. He doesn't understand it. Only God understands it. And that's one of the reasons why it's so powerful. So walk that process through a little bit and seek the Lord in this way. Amen? I really hope today's message was life-giving. As a church, we want to help you encounter God and take another next step in your allegiance to Jesus. I want to ask you to take a step right now, in fact. Would you just share this message with a friend? Maybe post it on your social, text a coworker the link. Just be sure to include something that you learned or how it impacted you personally. When you do that, you get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in someone else. And don't forget to visit our central hub, faithchurchks.org. You'll find other next steps that you can take in your faith, including giving and partnership with us as we help others encounter Jesus like you've encountered him. Hey, we love you. And until we get to hang out again, remember, don't shrink back from your faithful allegiance to King Jesus.